The world watched the heartbreaking saga of the Ocean Gate submersible Titan with bated breath. Now, a new documentary has chronicled the Titan disaster in excruciating detail. The Titan submersible was already in a compromised state before it even began its intended descent to view the remains of the Titanic in June 2023. By that time, OceanGate CEO and Titan builder Stockton Rush, a not particularly well-trained but experienced submersible pilot, had reportedly taken paying guests on more than a dozen Titanic dives into the Atlantic Ocean. That put a lot of wear and tear on the vessel from the ocean in terms of water pressure. Even worse, Rush utilized a sub-design he thought would be innovative and less expensive, fusing two titanium ends to a central core of carbon fiber. Generally, submersibles use more titanium for that section rather than carbon because it's stronger and more durable. Not only was Titan built from experimental materials that had been weathered by the ocean, but on the day of what would be its final descent in 2023, operators at OceanGate transported it to the dive site by towing it behind a rented ship, the Polar Prince. In the documentary, The Titan Sub-Disaster, Minute by Minute, Marine engineer Bart Kemper said that in order to eliminate unnecessary damage through vibration, impact, and exposure, the team should have moved the submersible by hauling it out on the deck of the ship. The Polar Prince simply didn't have the deck space to make such an accommodation. The first instance of tragic foreshadowing occurred well before the submersible's final voyage to the bottom of the sea on June 18, 2023. In its previous Titanic viewing trips, Titan departed Newfoundland in July and August, the heart of the summer when the Atlantic Ocean is reasonably calm and warm, or at least more so than it is in June. Hamish Harding, a billionaire who was aboard Titan, was aware that their weather conditions at launch were an aberration. He announced on Facebook on June 17th, Due to the worst winter in Newfoundland in 40 years, this mission is likely to be the first and only manned mission to the Titanic in 2023. A weather window has just opened up and we are going to attempt a dive tomorrow. Stockton Rush knew that the weather wasn't completely summer-like, however, which is why he decided to risk a Titanic mission so early. He admitted to associates that he wanted to see large chunks of ice, or even an iceberg, just like the one that destroyed the Titanic to heighten his customers' experience of traveling to see that famously downed ship. The Titan sub-disaster, minute by minute, provides plenty of context to the compressed timeline of the events involving the Titan. Viewers are able to comprehend the situation a bit more thanks to footage and first-hand accounts of what happened with the submersible and its ship escort, the Polar Prince, in the hours leading up to its ill-fated voyage to the Titanic site. They intended to launch the Titan at 4 a.m. on Sunday, June 18, 2023, with the intent to launch Titan at 4 a.m. But despite the previous day's forecast of good launch day weather, it was an uncharacteristically foggy day off the coast of Newfoundland that morning, and the Polar Prince and Titan personnel had to wait until the fog lifted or dissipated to make for as safe a start as possible. But as the Titan sub-disaster depicts, OceanGate CEO and submersible leader Stockton Rush became increasingly agitated and annoyed the longer he had to wait. Finally, with Rush pushing for the voyage to begin as soon as possible, the submersible began its descent at 8 a.m. Producers of the Titan sub-disaster used amateur video footage of Stockton Rush briefing passengers before a previous Titanic viewing voyage. While people who knew and worked with Rush characterized the entrepreneur as an optimistic maverick, Rush soberly informs prior Titan adventurers of the full risks of the dive, chiefly that his vessel, however impressive he finds it, is experimental and thus unreliable. He assures any nervous paying passengers that they will have an out if they want to back out before the descent begins in earnest. This is an experimental sub. People are informed that it's very dangerous down there. The Titan sub-disaster goes on to detail the legalities and paperwork Titan passengers, including those on the fatal 2023 trip, faced. For example, each was required to sign a multi-page waiver that mentions the possibility of death several times on page one. However, an opt-out may not have been so easy. Immediately after signing the waiver, passengers were loaded into the tiny submersible. A crew then closed a hatch and bolted it shut behind them from the outside before the vessel's safety check. At that point, and even before the sub was underwater, there was no turning back. This is the point of no return. If there was any point to freak out, now would be the point to freak out. The submersible encountered trouble at 9.45 a.m., less than two hours after it began its descent into the Atlantic Ocean. At that moment, the sub lost all communication with the surface. 
Marine engineers and sub-experts interviewed in the documentary, including Titanic film director James Cameron, theorize that on board Titan, a system alert warning of a hull failure sounded, and the crew likely dropped its ascent weights in an attempt to head back to the surface. And they probably had warning that their hull was starting to delaminate. It's unknown what exactly happened, or what happened next, due to the communications outage. Judging by the usual speed of Titan's descent, it's unlikely that the vessel was far enough along to view the Titanic crash site. Later in the documentary, it's definitively revealed that Titan passengers indeed never got to see the Titanic at any point in their journey. The sub never fully descended because the moment it lost communications, it suffered a virtually simultaneous violent episode that led to instant and complete destruction. The Titan sub disaster, minute by minute, spends a significant amount of time speculating on life inside that sub and what awful possibilities the people involved may have faced. For example, before it became clear that Titan had violently come apart underwater, rescuers entertained the possibility that the sub had resurfaced and drifted far away from the initial dive site. Concerted rescue efforts included Canadian military planes scanning an area as wide as 7,500 square miles looking for life. This wouldn't necessarily have resulted in a happy ending. A total of 15 bolts locked the vessel into an airtight state from the outside. Had the vessel re-emerged, and if it were not spotted by rescuers by the time oxygen stores were depleted, the passengers could have frozen to death or asphyxiated while viewing the outside world and its breathable air through porthole windows. Just a few hours into the Titan rescue drive, equipment operated by both the US and Canadian navies detected a sound that emanated from near the known final resting place of the Titanic wreckage. As that's where Titan was heading, it seemed likely that the submersible was responsible for the sound. Analysis by the US Navy determined that the sound was an anomaly consistent with an implosion or explosion. Essentially, and as explained by the Titan sub-disaster minute by minute, High-ranking members of the search and rescue squad knew the Titan had imploded before the sub had even been reported missing. The five days of hopeful searching for an intact ship with a live crew was ultimately all for naught, and the US Navy didn't reveal this until after the Odysseus 6K submersible discovered Titan rubble. The eeriest part of the Titan story reached the public for the first time via the Titan sub-disaster minute by minute. On June 20th, 2023, about two days after Titan disappeared, Canadian military plane-based sonar devices detected a rhythmic banging sound delivered in a tap-tap-tap-tap sequence, which repeated around every half hour. The Titan sub-disaster, minute by minute, plays a recording of the sounds several times, demonstrating how such a discovery charged and inspired the rescue teams. Individuals associated with the rescue effort thought it could be the sound of someone inside Titan banging on a wall, attempting to call for help with the only method available. It's more likely that the ominous or hopeful banging had nothing to do with Titan. Those sounds could have come from another surface-level ship nearby, or been generated by metallic objects in the ever-shifting sunken debris of the Titanic. It likely wasn't a distress call, because there's a certain protocol of sounds sub-crews are supposed to engage when their vessel sinks and communication systems fail. Additionally, it was later determined that Titan had already imploded well before the transmission of the metal banging sounds. The Titan sub-disaster, minute by minute, includes an extensive first-hand account of the submersible rescue efforts from Ed Cassano, CEO of Pelagic Research Services, owner and operator of a remote-operated, highly sophisticated submersible capable of withstanding depths even greater than that of Titan. Government agencies contacted Pelagic, which thanks to a U.S. Air Force transport of its vessel, arrived at the dive site and made its descent just past 4 a.m. on Thursday, June 22nd, four days after Titan failed to materialize and with an estimated five hours of oxygen remaining in the ship if it were still stranded and whole. Pelagic workers plunged the Odysseus 6K at a faster rate than usual because time was of the essence. 35 meters per minute versus 25 meters. At 6.15 a.m., with two hours of theoretical oxygen left on Titan, the ROV encountered a technical issue. Its thrusters failed, rendering it entirely useless. Workers had few options besides turning off the system and turning it back on again. That method worked, and Odysseus 6K continued its briefly delayed descent. When it landed on the ocean floor, Titan would likely have had little to no breathable air left, making Odysseus 6K's efforts at this stage all the more critical. When the moment that Titan was predicted to run out of oxygen came and went, 
rescuers continued to work, even though the possibility that the passengers were still alive diminished with every moment. Four hours into the revamped mission, the Odysseus 6K's cameras made a grisly and haunting discovery in Titan's debris field, a large piece of metal, unmistakably the tail cone of Titan. And by 12 o'clock, sadly, a rescue turned into a recovery. The remote-controlled sub found this remnant on the ocean floor just 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic. Experts observed that the state of the cone bore signs of implosion. Over the next four days, the Pelagic team led the debris collection effort, which continued without pause and involved six dives of the Odysseus 6K. On June 28th, a ship hauled back what the ROV could locate of Titan. When the fragments were returned to the docks in Newfoundland, Reporters noted how the pieces were immediately recognizable as submarine parts, like an intact nose cone, strands of the hull, and portholes with the glass blown out. The debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. Millions closely followed the events surrounding the hunt for the Titan submersible, transfixed by the dramatic and unpredictable situation. While many held out hope that the five people inside the deep-sea vessel were still alive several days after the sub failed to resurface, marine vehicle experts found it tough to stay optimistic. They'd ominously and fearfully predicted Titan's ultimate fate. Marine engineer Bart Kemper said in The Titan Sub-Disaster, Minute by Minute, there are those that have said it's just a question of not if, but when something would go wrong. He was also a signatory on a letter sent to Rush in March 2018. Fearing a Hindenburg event, the Marine Technology Society's letter urged Rush to pull back with his submersible, to carefully think out every aspect of its construction and use. According to footage of Rush in the documentary, the CEO bragged about cutting corners and breaking rules, proudly proclaiming himself to be an innovator and a rogue. Rush was particularly pleased with himself for building Titan out of two titanium capsules and imperfectly bonding carbon fiber. That lack of stability helped lead to the deadly implosion that would destroy Titan and kill everyone on board.